without further ado, here's uh, Jason Johansson. He's with Agility. He'll be providing our laser safety and service today. All right, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good to go on that one? Sweet. All right, well, good morning. My name is Jason Johansson. I'm the clinical education and training manager with Agility. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've been in the healthcare industry for 27 years. Started off as an orderly mop, slinging mops in the OR. Uh, did anesthesia tech stuff for several years. I've been with my company, just celebrated 19 years. Uh, started off as a laser tech, just like the guys you see here. Uh, did sales down in LA and Orange County. Um, and for just about almost four years now, I've been the clinical educator for the West Coast. I love this role. I love getting in front of our customers like yourselves to talk about laser safety. We are 100% dedicated to the safe use of lasers in healthcare, so that's why we're here today to talk with you about that. <clears throat> All right, so some of the things you guys need to know. I know there's some cool little uh, animations here. <laughs> I love the giggles. All right, so some of the things that um, you know you guys need to know, uh, Joint Commission, they're really starting to crack down on whether you own or you rent lasers. They don't care. They want to see that you guys have a laser safety program and a laser safety officer in place. Um, so they're really starting to crack down on us. So when they do their, their surveys and they come to town, they're going to start asking you guys some questions about laser safety. So do you guys know who your medical laser safety officer is? Aye. Right on. Good. That's a good start. Um, <laughs> Can't tell you how many facilities I go to that don't have a program in place, don't have a laser safety officer, and they're just, you know, they're treading water. So, uh, what types of lasers do you guys have on campus here? And what types of lasers do you guys rent from us as your third party vendor? Homium. Homium? Yeah. Yeah? CO2? Very good. It's important to know this. They're going to want to understand that you guys know what you guys have on campus. And lastly, this is the international starburst symbol for laser danger. You're going to see this on the signage. It just means laser danger. You know, you, got, you guys want to know what you're walking into. Can you guys hear me over there okay? All right, cool. All right. Now, I'm not going to geek out on laser physics too much, but I do want to give you guys a couple little things. So, the term laser is actually an acronym. It stands for Light Amplification by Stimulated Emissions of Radiation. Now, when we talk about stimulated emissions of radiation, we need to understand that this that lasers do not have the same ionizing characteristics of, of, of C arms and X-ray equipment, so there's the, they don't have the same unigenic properties. So, working around laser systems, completely safe. If you're pregnant, you don't need to be worried about that. Also, all laser systems have what's called a medium. It's what helps create that wavelength. Oftentimes, the laser system is named by that wavelength. You got homium lasers that utilize a rare earth homium crystal uh, to generate that wavelength. Uh, you got thelium lasers that utilize a thelium crystal. CO2 utilizes CO2 gas. You have diode systems. And lastly, all laser systems have what's called a chromophore. It's what that laser light is attracted to. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we're getting cut off a little bit. Anyway, um, again, the reason we're here is lasers are dangerous. You know, primarily because they're a uh, risk of burns, fire, ocular injury, and electrical hazards. We're working with, you know, significant wavelengths that can do some damage and a, and a pretty significant ignition source uh, with la the laser uh, wavelength itself. <laughs> All right, the American National Standards In Institute, or ANSI for short, um, created the ANSI standards. Now there's a dot one version, which is just the general safe use of lasers. Uh, then they created the DOT-3 version, which, which drilled it down to the safe use of lasers in healthcare. They also have other versions for veterinary use, industrial use, and what have you. But the DOT-3 version is what we utilize uh, for safe use of lasers in healthcare. Now, ANSI, they're not a governing agency. They're not going to come in and do, you know, site evaluation on you like, you know, Joint Commission or anything. They're, they're not going to come in and fine you. But Joint Commission, AORN, OSHA have all adopted the ANSI standards for safe use of lasers, and they just they go by you know these standards when they come in to do uh, your site surveys. Now it's very important to understand you guys having laser systems yourself that they're in the end of 2018 coming into 2019. ANSI did a revision on the ANSI standards. There's a big gray area around laser operators. Uh, a lot of facilities that own their own lasers maybe have nurses taking care of patients, but also running that laser system. They saw a big problem with that because if you're taking care of a patient but also running the laser, if you have to go out and get some medication for your anesthesiologist, who's taking care of that laser? So they saw a big problem with that. They really wanted to delineate the role. So uh, the new standard is that if you guys are running laser systems, you have to have a dedicated laser operator. Uh, also surrounding that, that laser operator needs to be appropriately trained and certified to run that laser system. And that certification needs to be maintained and updated with the uh, documentation. So that was the big, um, the big revision uh, this past year. So uh, it's good to know that. <clears throat> All right, when we talk about laser systems themselves, we have four primary classifications, class 1, class 2, class 3B, and class 4 lasers. 
Now when we talk about class one and class two systems, very low power related systems. You know, lasers inside pointers, uh, inside DVD players, inside the scanners at supermarkets. Again, very low power, don't require any specialized training, any specialized eyewear to operate those systems. It's not until we get into class three, you have class three B and four systems where we need to take some precautions in place. So class three B, you're gonna see some of these in dental offices for curing of fillings. Um, uh, some of the eye lasers are class 3B systems, but all the systems that we bring in, and majority of the ones that you guys have, you're all class 4 systems, again, because they're level hazard. The CO2, the thelium, the green lights, the holmiums, again, all class 4 systems. So you guys have a documented program in place. That's amazing. Kyle's doing a wonderful job. He's got a lot of responsibilities as a medical laser safety officer. He needs to, A, make sure that you, know, you guys have your program in place, your policies in place. Uh, if you guys, you, when you guys utilize a third party vendor like ourselves for supplemental uh, rentals, uh, he needs to make sure that our technicians are appropriately credentialed, that our equipment is up to par, you know, being checked in by Biomed. Um, you know, if you're physicians, you maybe have a new physician that wants to utilize the latest system, Kyle needs to make sure that that, that physician is appropriately credentialed to run that system. You, you just can't let people come in and, and do their own thing. Uh, again, when we come in, you guys don't operate under our policies. We want to be in alignment with your laser safety policies. So again, that's the importance. Uh, and also, if, uh, are you certified medical laser safety officer? No, just LSO. So Kyle does have the opportunity to become a certified medical laser safety officer uh, through the Board of Laser Safety, which is um, the role I uh, carry with my company. All right, when we talk about uh, the use of lasers, you got two, two main characters. You got the laser operator, who has no competing responsibilities, and you have the laser user. The laser operator, their responsibilities are to ensure that the laser system is set up. Want to make sure, you know, when we come in, we wipe that system down, get it checked in my biomed. I'm sure your system's are already dialed in, ready to go. But we're making sure we're test firing that laser system, ensuring that we're setting that room up appropriately, hanging, hanging signage on the doors, eyewear on the doors, covering windows when necessary. Um, all for the laser user. Physicians, sometimes even a nurse practitioner, again, that's been trained on that system and understands the, the clinical outcomes you're trying to get with that system. So, have you guys transferred to Epic, or are you guys currently using that? Yeah, we, we've used that. Okay, cool. All right, so this is a copy of our laser log uh, that we utilize when we come into town to work with you guys. Uh, the top section here is just some pertinent information about the case itself. Uh, we document all the, all the players in the room, and we document their eyewear compliance. I, I imagine that your policy says you're supposed to wear eyewear for all laser wavelengths and all types of cases, but if you decide not to, our technicians will mark no, and then I get a phone call, and then I call Kyle. Uh, this bottom section is just our safety checklist, you know, make sure we know where the uh, extinguisher is, that we're covering windows, doing all the safety checkups, all that fun stuff. Our technicians sign it and then we print it and then we have you as the nurse sign it. We then make a couple copies, you can utilize the information to put into your EPIC uh, documentation system, keep a copy with the patient chart or your laser log, whatever, what have you. Again, this it becomes a legal document and it needs to be in that, in that record. Uh, one, sorry, one thing that we're working on, or actually I'm working on, my goal for 20, uh, 2020, uh, our, our laser logs are very generic. Um, there's an actual treatment section that's uh, a second page here. I'm trying to narrow this down or uh, kind of make this more laser specific. Uh, our treatment log is very generic, so you may see um, uh, documentation of the settings and stuff put into the comments section if they don't necessarily fit in the um, on the other page. So just so you know that you might see uh, some information on the comment section. Alright, your eyes, you know, I'm going to stress this the most, your eyes are the most vulnerable part of your body to accidental laser light interaction. Reason being is your eyes have what's called the optical gain effect. Much like a magnifying glass, your eyes will magnify light 150 to 250,000 times. So if you're exposed to laser light, it can do some pretty significant damage. So what kind of damage are we talking about? And I have till 8 o'clock, right? 7.45-ish? Yeah. Um, what happened here? Oh, okay, one more, one more slide. All right, so we need agility. We just consider the entire operating room that we're working in is the danger zone. Uh, all laser systems have what's called the nominal ocular hazard zone. It's the, the danger zone of that laser system. It could be 13 inches, it could be 13 feet. It really depends on the wavelength, the power we're utilizing, the, the, the uh, delivery device. So we just said, you know, where we're working is the danger zone. This is the formula to figure out the nominal ocular hazard zone way above my pay grade. So we just said the entire room is the danger zone. Anyone coming in and out of that room needs to be protected. So uh, we talked about a laser's chromophore. What that laser light is attracted to, right? It could be water, it could be hemoglobin, it could be pigmented tissue, tattoo ink, what have you. All laser systems have a primary chromophore. 
So homium and CO2, two lasers you guys have on campus, their primary chromophore is water. They're seeking out water and tissue to vaporize that. And that's why CO2 is utilized primarily for skin resurfacing. It vaporizes tissue on a cellular level. That's why you get that nice smooth surface when you're done. So being attracted to water, you know, their wavelength is very wide, uh, very wide wavelength. It's, it's, it's absorbed very quickly. Uh, and these are invisible. You can't see these. That's why they're required to have Amy beams. So being that they're attracted to water, if you're exposed to homey or CO2, if you're not wearing your glasses, you're going to have a nice corneal burn or even some damage to your, to your lens. Now you can go to the surgery center down the street and get a lens replacement, but I think we're all too young for that. Now we start talking about argon, KTP, the green light laser. These are all visible light laser systems, much more dangerous Dangerous, uh, you know, still, these are dangerous, but these are much more dangerous. They have, they, their penetration is much deeper. Their primary chromophore is hemoglobin. So if you're not wearing your eyewear for these types of procedures, they're going to go right through your cornea, right through your lens, and they're going to target your nice red retina. Now, depending on where that hits, it hits your pavea, you're not going to be able to focus properly. It it's anywhere else, it's going to leave black spots. If it hits your optic nerve, you're going to be blinded. And this is irreversible damage. So again, it's very important to make sure we're wearing our eyewear for these cases. Now, a lot of people think that eyewear is universal. Couldn't be furthest from the truth. Eyewear is very specific to the wavelength that we're working with. And how do we know that? All laser protective eyewear has an optical density rating and wavelengths that it will protect you against. Now, when we talk about optical density, it's some logarithmic value, again, way above my pay grade. I like to think of it like car tent. Uh, for some laser systems, we want to filter out a lot of light because uh, of the, the dangers of that wavelength. So they're much like you know limo tint on cars. They just they filter out a lot of light. You know you'll see that in some of the the green light laser and even some of the um, cosmetic systems. Uh, lower optical density uh, is I kind of like thinking about like just factory tint. You can see right into your car. Uh, CO2 homing lasers they allow a lot of light in again because those wavelengths are much less uh, they, they penetrate a lot less. Now it's very important that you, got, you, know, you guys owning your own laser systems, you need to make sure that you can read the, the labeling on that eyewear. If you can't see that, then how do you know what you're being protected against? I can't tell you how many site surveys I do where I go and look at eyewear, they're all scratched up. You can't even read this. Again, you guys need to do your due diligence. If you can't read this, it's actually an OSHA violation. It could be a fine if you can't read that. So you've got to make sure if you guys see something, let Kyle know so that he can get that out of circulation and get you guys some new eyewear. Also, prescription eyewear is not laser safe. It's not ANSI approved. It doesn't have any of these cool numbers on it. I know my note. Uh, but again, they don't have any type of side protection. So most, uh, almost all laser protective eyewear is designed to go over prescription eyewear. So if you wear those, uh, get a pair of goggles that works for you. Set them aside. Let your nurse or you know, what have you know. These are the pair that I'm going to need for the case. Uh, but it's also important to understand that laser protective eyewear does not protect you against a direct shot to the eye. If your physician is doing a laser light show in the room being a ding dong and he, he tags you with that laser light, it could do some damage. Again, it's for you know, just diffuse and scattered laser light uh, that can happen in the room. But you know, don't ever intentionally try to view you know, down the hand pieces to see that laser coming out. Um, and again, just make sure you understand that. Uh, a lot of people think that eyewear is uncomfortable. Um, you know, some of the uh, uh, the higher IOD ratings, the darker lenses can make people kind of feel a little, you know, a little sick sometimes. Um, so we ask, always wear the arms outside the bouffant cap, you know, if we need to get those off to you so you can kind of gain your bearings, uh, we can do that. Use the retaining straps that are available. We don't want these falling to the floor. They are expensive. But most importantly, we don't want them falling to your back table or sterile field. Now, it's also under, uh, important to understand that uh, these Laser protective eyewear has specialized coatings on them. The glass itself is, is one thing, but they also have a chemical coating on them that helps, helps with that optical density rating. So these glasses cannot be cleaned with the same harsh chemicals that we wipe down OR surfaces with. They can only be cleaned with soap and water. So we ask that you never handle them with bloody or dirty gloves. We also ask that when you're done with them, don't ever lay them down on the lenses themselves. They're very susceptible to hitting and scratching. You know, laying them up, so the lenses are up, or put them in their case. Uh, over time, that pitting and scratching can allow uh, laser light in through those glasses. Now for your patients, we want to make sure that they're protected during laser cases. The ANSI standard is that their eyes need to be taped completely shut with no gaps. That's the standard. Uh, a lot of facilities have, um, you know, above and beyond measures. They want to make sure that they're, you know, maybe a patient has eyewear on them also. We like to employ secondary line defense. We always ask that we maybe pull the drapes up or even put a blue towel over the patient's face. But again, the standard is that their eyes need to be taped completely shut with no gaps. Now, for patients that are awake or lightly sedated, we will outfit them with a pair of goggles or glasses. Uh, but we're going to ask them to keep their eyes closed during the case. They don't need to see what's going on. 
Now, for surgical cases that uh, where a pair of glasses might inhibit the procedure, you know, maybe we're doing a bleft, what have you, uh, we can utilize corneal shields or ocular shields. Now, if laser's not in the picture and we're doing a case and the, you have the old plastic shields are totally fine, but the moment we introduce laser to the equation, they need to be these uh, metal shields with the matte finish, plastic burns. I've never seen it, but I can't imagine a flaming eyeball in the operating room is any good. So make sure we're utilizing the appropriate eye shields when we're utilizing uh, with lasers. All right, um, viewing optics. Now this is primarily uh, for visible light laser systems, uh, KTP, what have you. Um, if we're utilizing CO2 with, uh, with a microscope, physician does not need to wear glasses. Uh, ANSI has determined that all the oculars within that uh, microscope uh, will protect him uh, during that laser use. So this is, again, primarily for the KTP visible light laser systems. So I'm going to go back and forth. I want to redo this slide so they're all on one page. But all right, so this is what we call an automatic eye safety filter. We utilize this uh, on the microscope itself. It goes in between the oculars and the, and the rest of the arm, and it connects to the back of the uh, macular laser system. So when the physician depresses the foot pedal and activates the laser, a specialized lens clicks down um, and protects them just like a pair of glasses. Now we need to be mindful when we utilize these that if we have multiple uh, ports for our viewers, you know, maybe an, uh, an accessory port for an assistant, what have you, we need to make sure that that is placed in the appropriate spot. If there isn't a spot for it, so everyone can be covered, then we need to make sure that that assistant is protected with a pair of glasses. I can't tell you how many instances we've had where, you know, people thought they were covered, they, they are exposed because they're looking through and they're not covered. So again, we want to make sure that everyone's protected. Uh, we also have endoscope caps. These go on the end of uh, telescopes. Uh, we do a lot of science endoscopy cases with KTP where we're doing reduction of turbulence. Uh, Physicians just put that cap on there and just look down while he's lasering. Protects him just like a pair of glasses. And lastly, we have what we call the gold filter. Uh, this is primarily just for the green light laser. Do you guys have any experience with the green light laser? Crickets? No? Okay, good. All right, this isn't for your protection. It's actually for the protection of your very expensive camera equipment. This goes in between the camera and the lens. And, um, you know, it's, it's there to protect, you know, laser light is so intense and so bright that if it's not in there, maybe you've forgotten once or twice, it just whites out the screen and over time that can do some damage. Uh, we've actually made an investment in our fleet of uh, instrumentation to include, they, they, with, they have lenses that actually have an integrated filter so our technicians know uh, which ones would need that filter and which don't. Now you see that on this lens it says OD5 at 532 and 1064, the writing's all out on these. Again, just like a pair of glasses, they are very specific to the wavelength that we're working with. All right, here's a typical laser danger sign. Uh, they're going to be posted on every doorway, as you can see here. Uh, when you come in to do, you know, do your break, what have you, you want to be checking that laser eyewear to the wavelength and laser type. You want to make sure that they match. I think our company does a pretty good job when we, uh, with our quality department. Again, you want to do your due diligence, make sure you're putting the right pair of eyewear uh, on your face. So you want to make sure that they uh, coincide with each other. Uh, a laser danger sign should be on every doorway leading into that operating room. You want to know what you're walking into. And a laser pair, uh, a pair of laser protective eyewear should be on the main entry doorway. I see a lot of people coming in to get their brains, kind of peeking in the room, seeing what's going on, you know. That could allow laser light outside that room. So, you want to put that eyewear on first, come in, do your business. When you're done giving that break, what have you, please put that eyewear back in the case. Uh, I don't know what you guys have set up here, but uh, put that eyewear back in the case. So again, the next person coming in to give a break, what have you, they can be protected when they come in. All right, we are a coverall company. Uh, we cover the windows for all laser wavelengths, all types of procedures. What's your policy? We cover coverings. Okay, cool. Um, and it's your responsibility to provide those coverings. Uh, we go to a lot of hospitals throughout the nation where you know we're having to kind of figure out stuff. Uh, but it is a facility's responsibility to provide window coverings. Best is these uh, draw type shades. A lot of facilities have those uh, stick-on magnetic ones, which are really awesome. If those aren't provided, then we need to kind of figure out, okay, what's the next best thing? Um, you know, you kind of have to you know, weigh, weigh the outcomes here. So the next best thing is actually if these are not available, any kind of stick-on or draw shades, instrumentation wrappers. Instrumentation wrappers are great. They're actually manufactured with a chemical inside them uh, that does not support a flame. So if a physician with a ding-dong, he went up and said, oh, I'm going to see if it'll burn, and he does it, as soon as he removes the heat source, it'll snuff out. So uh, instrumentation wrappers work really well. Uh, if we get to that point where we don't have those, which I can't imagine, but then we can start thinking, okay, well, maybe, you know, the next best thing is actually no wire towel. Not ideal, but again, you've got to start outweighing the risk versus benefit. You know, do I want laser light going outside that room, or do I want to at least uh, try to protect it for going out? So OR towels would be the next best thing. Well, we don't want to utilize any type of paper products um, or plastic products. I actually did a site survey uh, a little further north in here. 
Um, and they had um, all those orange, you know, the orange things that you put the put on the floor. Do you have those on there? Yes. Yeah, those aren't good. Yeah, you should probably take them. They were up yesterday. All right. Oh, well, it wasn't here. It was another place too. Uh, but yeah, those uh, those aren't those aren't uh, those aren't won't up prevent laser light from exiting the room. And they're, you know, they're made of plastic, so probably not the most ideal. So if you guys got the draw shades, uh, that would be that would be perfect. All right, uh, laser setup. Uh, when we come into town, we want to be in a position where we can view what's going on. Um, you know, we're going to set up the laser system uh, so we can kind of be there, make sure that the position is utilizing the instrumentation appropriately, handling that fiber appropriately. Uh, we're going to make sure that we are allow for normal movement around the back of the laser system. If you guys operate your own laser systems, you need to be very territorial about the front of that laser, where that laser aperture is, where that fiber attaches to the laser system. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've brushed up a couple of, a couple times, broken fibers, but nurses, scrub techs, you know, doctors. So be very territorial about that, but allow people to move around the back of your laser. Uh, we need to separate foot pedals. When that doctor is ready to utilize the laser, you need to say, okay, doc, what, what foot do you want the pedal under? Put it right there, get everything that's out of the way. He, needs, he, he should not be guessing, he or she should not be guessing when he's pushing that down there. Again, that's how accidents happen. Um, never post up underneath a pressure bag. I'm sure many of you have seen a pressure bag below at some point in your career. If that happens over a laser system, it'll be a catastrophic failure of that laser and a potential electrical hazard to the staff. So again, make sure um, you, know, you know, put an extension on, move it away from the laser system. Move it on the other side of the patient. Do what you need to do, but please don't ever put that right over the laser. Uh, again, we just want to make sure we're viewing what's going on. Here. Um, we want to make sure we don't create any tripping hazards. When we set up laser systems, we want to lay the cords out, uh, electrical cords and foot pedal cords out nice and neat. But again, don't ever roll over these cords, especially foot pedal cords. You guys have home -in systems, and those home -in foot pedals are tw like 20 little tiny wires. You roll over that once or twice, it could damage that laser uh, foot pedal cord. And that doctor goes push on the pedal, nothing happens, nothing worse. So uh, make sure that you never do that. And actually, some laser systems actually have pneumatic uh, foot pedals. It's just a little, you know, straw tube. So if you roll over that and kink it, it could uh, render that uh, foot pedal non-usable. All right, this is uh, this is a uh, one of our uh, biomed techs doing some um, testing on the laser system. This is actually a homium system. You should never see this from any of our technicians. None of them are certified to open up the skins of a laser system. Uh, reason being is most lasers have a capacitor in them that stores electrical energy for settings, updates, and such. And it can deliver a pretty hefty shock if you're not careful. So again, none of us are certified. I'm not sure any of you are either, but uh, again, we should not be doing this in the operating room. All right, we are working with a pretty significant heat source and ignition source of laser, so we need to remember the past protocol. If you guys have a fire breakout, you know, sound that alarm, pull the, pull the, trick, or pull the alarm. And grab your nearest extinguisher, remember the past protocol. Pull the pin, aim it at the base of the fire, squeeze the handle, and sweep from side to side. Now, almost all dry chemical extinguishers only have about 20 seconds of chemical in them, so you know, give yourself some time, spurt it out, uh, if that's the type of extinguisher you have, uh, and again, wait for some backup. We do see a lot of facilities moving away from dry chemical extinguishers in the confined space of an OR because the dry chemical can do some very significant and ruin a lot of uh, can do some significant damage. Um, we, they, you know, that dry chemical gets into computers, anesthesia machines, laser systems, and ruins it. Uh, so we see a lot of facilities moving away from dry chemical and moving more toward the halon or halotron um, e uh, extinguishers in that confined space. Uh, again, you should know the nearest location. We mark it on our laser log. Uh, again, used for combustible uh, material fires, not for patient fires. Anytime we're doing lasers, we should always have a, a base of sterile water and a, a pitcher of sterile water on the field. That's what we're going to utilize if we have a patient fire. If we're doing any type of ENT case, you should always have uh, a pitcher of water uh, with the bulb syringe full on your mayo stand, ready at all times. That uh, basin of water is going to be utilized for uh, wetting OR towels. We want to make sure that we're covering all exposed areas with wet towels. We don't want any dry drapes or any uh, you know, uh, un or exposed tissue that we don't want to have uh, uh, you know, laser uh, treatment to. Uh, we actually had an incident um, in the Washington area a couple weeks ago uh, out in Spokane doing a GYN case. A uh, lady was up in high lithotomy getting ready to do a cervical ablation. Uh, had the microscope in place before they, were to, they went to do the test fire. So they had the abdomen draped, they had the overlegs all draped with wet towels. Physician had her tongue blade right between the legs, pointed down the floor, fired. Well, that went, laser energy went right through that tongue blade and right into the under buttocks drape that didn't have, a, have a, a, um, any covering. So there was a little a fire that started there. So again, you want to make sure you're covering all areas with wet towels, uh, abdomen, legs, and under buttocks. 
Um, you can also utilize wet sponges uh, and Raytex to cover areas. If you're working perianal, you do need to be wearing methane gas ignition. I've seen it one time and it was really funny. This doctor was all up in this guy's business doing a hemorrhoidectomy. Little blue flame snuck out. The doctor thought he lost his eyebrows. It was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, tonsil sponges work really well for that. Wet them up, stick them in. Make sure we're wetting these uh, tails also because they're, they're flammable. And then again, we'll make sure we're pulling those out at the end of the case, but those work really well. All right, laser fiber handling. Uh, almost every laser system you guys have here, homeums, uh, CO2 lasers now have uh, fiber optic delivery devices. Um, they're all utilize a very specialized silica glass. Um, it's very fragile, that's why they have multiple uh, layers of coatings to protect them. Um, this is probably my favorite video on here. You can see this guy's hand, oh, it's not going, anyway. Um, he hands this off to a, a you know, guy not wearing a glove. I, I just make fun of that every time. Anyway, uh, don't ever, you see that the backing card here? Almost all lasers come with some type of backing card. Um, don't ever rip the fibers off of that. That ripping action off of those cards can actually damage that laser fiber. They all have little pull tabs that you can uh, release to release that fiber. When you hand that fiber off to our tech or to your uh, laser operator, always leave the protective cap on here. The gap between where that laser energy exits the laser and then jumps to that laser fiber is less than a millimeter. So if there's any glove dust or KY on that fiber tip, it will render that fiber non-usable. Uh, the green light laser, it doesn't have a, a cap on it. So if you're going to hand that off to our, one of the technicians, hold it a little further back on the shank and hand that to the tech. Uh, if you're not going to deploy that fiber right away, scrub techs, you're more than welcome to put it on your back table, but please don't lean on it or put any uh, instrumentation on it because that can crack the fiber. Now this is what it looks like when, you, we, when, you, when a fiber is uh, bro broken. Ugh, can't talk. Uh, we've intentionally broken this fiber uh, and they usually will not break completely in half. You know, they, they've got you know, two to three coatings in there, uh, so the, the fiber will most likely stay intact, so you can see that here. So if you can still get an Amy beam through there, that means you can still get laser energy through there. Uh, please put this in the back of your mind. Big red flag. If you ever hear your doctor say, my Amy beam is diminished, or I have a decreased uh, you know, in tissue interaction, that's a big red flag, that's an immediate uh, timeout. You're going to pull that laser fiber out of that uh, scope or what have you and check the whole length of that fiber for something that looks like this. That's a telltale sign of a laser breakage. So if you can imagine this break another 8 inches up in your flexible ureter scope or another 18 inches draped over your patient's leg, that's where we're going to have a fire, damage to your equipment, or you know, injury to your patient. So again, make sure you're looking for those signs. All right, um, I'm a bit, so I have, in my 19 years at the company, we've always used wet towels to hold laser fibers to the field. I'm still a big proponent of laser fibers, but we actually had an incident uh, in Northern California where <clears throat> took an OR towel just like this, got it wet, and they did the taco maneuver, what I call the taco. They just opened it up once, put the fiber in there, and just set it on the patient's, you know, draped legs. Physicians here, scrub techs over here. Well, during the case, this had actually worked off the field, and when it fell to the floor, it fell in a fashion. When it fell hard like this, it snapped the fiber. Fiber came up, burnt through the scrub tech's gown and their, and their scrubs. Didn't burn them, but near miss. So, um, we're like, well, is wet Raytex, wet, wet, uh, wet um, sponge is better? They are, but I'm still a big fan of OR, wet OR towels. But what we're saying is get that OR towel nice and wet, but open it up completely. Get that towel nice and open like such, then lay it on your patient's draped leg. You can then drape the fiber over there, lasers over here, positions here, then kind of roll the wet towel up over that fiber. I don't know what your policy is here, but this is what I like. Um, that laser fiber is now going to be protected anywhere it's going to come in contact with that laser dra uh, drape and it's a lot less likely to fall off the floor because it has a lot more surface area that's in contact with that leg. So that's what I like to do. Again, wet towels is, is what, uh, what we recommend. What we don't want to see, we don't want to see any kind of wrapping of the drape around the fiber and clamping it or passing the fiber through you know, clamp handles and such. You know physicians are always tugging on light cords and camera cords, need more, need more slack. Well, if they go tugging on a fiber and this kind of, and when it's secured in this fashion, it's going to fulcrum against that metal. Metal against silica glass. Metal is going to win every single time. All right, uh, alcohol-based prep solutions. Uh, if we're realizing these, we make sure that we're monitoring those dry times. We want to let that alcohol off-gas before we drape and before we utilize any type of laser. Uh, petroleum ointments. Uh, a lot of anesthesiologists put petroleum ointment in the, in the eyes to protect during laser use. But again, if we're going to be working in that area. Petroleum based ointments will burn, so again, flaming eyeballs, haven't seen it, but I can't imagine it's any fun. Uh, also, this is just a kind of a possible scenario. Um, you know, we talked about lasers have uh, the primary chromophores. Well, some of them is pigmented tissue. 
Uh, if we're doing a case where maybe there's a, um, you know, a heavy dose of core prep or even some betadine, there are some lasers that can interact with those, those colors. So, um, you know, if you're doing that type of procedure with that, you want to make sure you're wiping that area clean uh, with sterile water or saline prior to laser use. All right, communication is key during all laser use. Um, you know, when I train our technicians, anytime the lasers, you know, doctor says ready, we're repeating that back. Laser's ready. Anytime laser goes in standby, we're repeating laser standby. Anytime there's a change in treatment parameters, uh, we're saying, you know, we're repeating it back. Yes. I just had a question about prep. So does that mean that we're doing uh, laser like on the cervix that there should be no vaginal prep? Because there's no way you can clean it out. It's more of a, a the, the types of lasers that interact with, um, Pigmented tissue is kind of the V beam, the lasers that work with um, you know removal of tattoos. It's more of a, a, a cautionary scenario uh, that if you're maybe going to do you know tattoo removal and you you decide to, to prep the area first, you want to remove that prep area, prep first uh, before lasering. It's it's not usually you're utilizing CO2 for those types of cases, which is not uh, doesn't interact with the, those types of things. It's more of a, a potential hazard. Good question though. Uh, again, anytime there's a change in treatment parameters, we should be repeating that back to the physician. If you guys hear, smell, see something funky, say something. Uh, I can't, you know, if, if it's when people don't say anything is when accidents happen. So, uh, you know, call that immediate timeout, troubleshoot if necessary, um, and we'll move on from there. All right, let's talk about laser generated airborne contaminants, also known in, as LGAC in the community. Um, you know, this yeah, absolutely should include. Uh, electric artery smoke. I just attended the International Laser Safety Conference and they actually presented some amazing papers about uh, uh, surgical plume. Uh, some of which, you know, some of that stuff even transfers through the placental barrier uh, through, you know, to the fetus. So it's, it's amazing uh, that this stuff is nasty. So uh, you want to get this stuff out of your environment. Uh, if you guys are creating any type of uh, hazardous smoke during the case, you want to get it exhausted out whether it's, you know, some type of exhaust ventilation in the room or a, a mobile system like this, we got stack house, buffalo filters, inline charcoal filters, a lot of the Neptune systems have integrated uh, suction into them. Again, first, uh, first line of defense is get that out of your environment, you don't want to be breathing it. Scrub techs, you're the ones usually holding the magic wand, you want to be one to two inches away from that target site, uh, but not too close where you're sucking up those laps or Raytex, because that can do some damage to those uh, systems. Um, also want to make sure that we're turning these on before the laser starts, I can't tell you, I've walked into rooms where it's like, Billows of smoke, and they're like, "Oh, I guess we should use the, the smoke evacuator." So again, before we before we start lasering, turn that suction uh, suction on. Just a little demo. My my boss. He's he's medium rare. All right, good. Enough. All right. Second line of defense is some type of laser plume mask. Uh, a lot of facilities are providing their staff with laser plume surgical masks. We provide that when we come in for cases. Uh, these protect you down to 0.1 microns. Your standard, standard surgical mask uh, is, is a lot less than that. Um, if these are not available, then you need, uh, ARON recommends utilizing the N95 respirator. They protect you down to 0.3 microns, but the main thing is that their thing is that they are, um, they, they, um, are fit tested. Now, if these are not, uh, um, they, we never recommend double masking. You double mask on N95, you're probably going to pass out. Um, but double masking actually makes it very difficult, even with a standard, uh, standard laser mask. If you double mask, it makes it very difficult to breathe. It wants to pull in air under your chin and under your cheeks. So you know, double masking is not recommended. When you lay, wear a laser plume mask, it's a little, a little bit different than wearing your regular surgery mask. You know, we all wear them kind of loose and stuff. But when we do laser cases, you want it nice and tight to your face, tied around your neck, tied over your head. We don't want to crisscross those ties because that will create a little gap you know, by your cheeks, a little tinting action that will allow smoke through there. So nice and tight around your neck and nice and tight over your head uh, for the duration of the procedure. Now it's important, it's not one or the other, and they need to work in conjunction. You need to evacuate that smoke and you need to wear your mask. It's not, I'm going to wear one or I'm just going to, you know, wear a standard surgical mask and suck the smoke out. They need to work in conjunction. All right, laser safe instrumentation, primarily for GYN and ENT type procedures. Um, they need to have one of these cool names, anodized, dull, matte, satin, or ebonized finish. It's a coating on that instrumentation or some type of finish that does not allow that laser beam to be reflected at its full power. Um, it absorbs, suffuses, and scatters that, that, um, that laser light. 
Um, again, primarily utilized for ENT uh, and GYN. I do see a lot of facilities utilizing their LEAP sets as uh, laser safe instrumentation. This would not be appropriate. Your LEAP sets actually have a plastic coating on them to prevent your patient from getting shocked. Um, but that's not appropriate because plastic burns. So uh, make sure we're utilizing the appropriate instrumentation for those types of procedures. All right, laser airway uh, risks. All right, we don't have very many walkway policies, but we got this one. Um, if we're sharing the airway with a laser, uh, we need to utilize either a laser safe, laser uh, safe ET tube or an alternative method of ventilation. If the physician decides that he doesn't want to do either of those, and we just won't turn the laser on, we're totally fine with that. We've lost business. We've lost customers. The litigation surrounding laser airway fires is not fun, again, for something that's almost completely preventable. I've been involved in one air, airway fire. Um, it was not fun. So, um, reason being is your standard endotracheal tube is made of polyvinyl fluoride, PVC. The same PVC you go to Home Depot you know, to buy for irrigation lines. It's the same stuff. When PVC catches fire, it off-gasses hydrochloric gas. Again, when hydrochloric gas gets into your patient's nice wet lungs, it creates hydrochloric acid. I can't imagine that feels too good. Also, we're working with high concentrations of oxygen. So as you can see here, we've lit this tube on fire and we're dunking it in water. It's creating a blowtorch effect. It's very difficult to extinguish that. So you can imagine this flame in your patient's lungs. Not, I can't imagine that feels too good. All right. Uh, we talk about alternative methods of ventilation. If you know we can't utilize an ET, a laser, sa a laser safe ET tube, then we need to utilize jet ventilation, spontaneous ventilation, apnea technique. Again, all still utilized today. Now we talk about uh, laser resistant ET tubes. Sorry, the top's cut off. Uh, they're made of everything but PVC, uh, silicone, rubber, metals, and ceramic. Um, anything that you know. This is a good. Um, uh, this is a silicone example. Uh, also, tracheostomy tubes need to be uh, uh, considered also. Uh, now, laser safety tubes, they can be very specific to a wavelength, or they can also span a broad range of wavelengths. So you need to make sure you're utilizing the appropriate one for the, the laser wavelength that we're working with. So here's that, uh, that silicone tube deployed. Uh, it's highly recommended that you use either methylene blue or uh, indigo carmine is totally fine also. Uh, inject and when you inflate the cuff, it helps. Um, it uh, inflates that cuff nice and blue. It's just a visual indicator to that physician. If that cuff becomes compromised, he's going to see a little blue leaking around those those uh, little, little, uh, the the cotinoids. Man, can't talk. Uh, again, like utilizing a secondary line of defense, put some white uh, cotinoids around there. Again, that's where we'll see that blue leaking around if we have um, uh, compromised cuff. Compromised cuff. Our technicians also talk that uh, the anesthesiologists make sure that we're between 21 and 30 percent O2 during laser use, and that we're not utilizing any nitrous oxide uh, during laser use. I, like I mentioned, I've been involved in one area fire. So at the end of the day, going to a surgery center across the street from a main hospital, I was doing a late case. Another technician had been there all morning doing cases. Came in to give him a break. Walk in the room as they're pulling a flaming tube out of this lady's throat. Main problem is. Um, they were a surgery center across the street that primi primarily did urology. They decided to do a tonsillectomy of all things. So um, they were not really set up for any of this. They didn't have a trach tray. They didn't have a flexible bronchoscope. They're in there trying to pull this, you know, material out of this lady's throat with, you know, urology graspers. Uh, anesthesiologists unfortunately filled that cup up with air instead of saline. So that was the, the major problem there. Um, go on the air on website. I highly recommend. There's a lot of stories of survivors. Uh, this lady did survive, uh, but there's also a lot of stories of people that didn't survive. There's uh, some some uh, pretty um, pretty uh, interesting stories on there. So again, if you guys are doing ENT cases, working with CO2 lasers, make sure you're protecting those patients, um, and make sure you guys have this stuff available if you guys have an airway fire breakout. Mm -hmm. This is just an example of a, 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 a tonsillectomy of all things being done with a CO2 fiber optic system. Uh, tube is protected. If that tube's not protected, that, that laser's going to creep around right there and it would have tagged that tube. So again, you know, near miss right there, but you know, tube is protected. Uh, but it's, you know, we're working in such a tight area, so you know, just that little, little bit of movement could do some significant damage if uh, you're not protected. All right, all laser systems have either a touch screen to turn them on or a key. So the key thing here is, yes, bad pun intended, you should never have a key hanging from an un unattended laser system. Now, when we come in to do laser cases with you guys, if you have seen our guys, we come in, we test fire our laser, and our technician goes in the corner and does their paperwork. Now, if that key is hanging from the laser, that's totally fine. That laser is not considered unattended. But the moment that technician or maybe your laser operator leaves the room to go get a cup of coffee, that is now considered an unattended laser, and it's a, a potential OSHA violation up to $35,000. So 
Uh, any, if you ever see a key hanging from a latest system, make sure you let those people know, you, you know your staff, that you can't do that. Um, uh, they should be locked up either in some type of wall lock box. I see a lot of facilities utilizing their Pixis systems to secure laser keys, which works really great. Uh, but again, if it's unattended, that's a potential hazard. All right, all laser systems have an on standby and a ready button. The only time we're going to put that laser in ready mode is when the physician is pointed at the intended target. All other times that laser needs to be in standby because we don't want any accidental fire into that laser system again because that's how accidents happen. And lastly, all laser systems have an emergency off button. It's usually located at the very top of the system or in the front. This will immediately shut down the laser. You know, if that laser, if the physician's on the pedal doing his work and you need to shut that system down, you can push on standby all day long. It will not shut that laser down. You, have, you will have to hit the emergency button. So fire malfunction on our unauthorized horseplay. Maybe our, our technician takes a digger, can't finish the case. I don't know. But again, that will immediately shut down the laser. Any questions? All right, you guys are all given a post test, right? You guys got it in front of you? All right, this is where you get to holler back at me so I know you were listening. All right, here we go. Come on. All right, the main safety risk of laser use are electrical burn, fire, and ocular injury. Very good. All right, the ANSI standards are intended to ensure the safe use of lasers in the healthcare industry. Very good. Aesthetic and surgical lasers are class two systems because of the level of hazard. What level are they? Very good, class three B and class four, very good. Uh, the structures they are most vulnerable to accidental laser light interaction. True, remember your eyes have that optical unit effect. It can magnify light 150, 250,000 times. Uh, laser protective eyewear is universal and therefore not specific to any wavelengths. Oh. Yeah, that's very, remember, they're very specific to the wavelengths that we're working with. The optical density rating and the, and the factors on that. Prescription eyewear may be used as laser protective eyewear for beams that will not penetrate glass. Oh. False. We want to make sure you're protecting your eyes for all laser wavelengths, all types of cases. Laser warning signs are not required for entry doorways where the laser is in use. Oh. No, we want you guys to know what you're walking into, right? All right, wet towels around the laser target site are used to protect surrounding tissues and drapes. True. Very good. Uh, it is safe to restrain a laser fiber by wrapping the drape around and securing it with a clamp. Oh. No, wet towels, wet towels, wet towels. Do you guys have a policy for la securing laser fibers in the field? No. What do you guys do? <laughs> Perfect, I love it. <clears throat> Verbal communication of the laser status is essential to laser safety. True. Yes, communication is key. Uh, special precautions do not need to be taken for protection against laser plume. What's your first line of defense? Get it out of the environment. Second line of defense? Mask. Again, working in conjunction. All right, laser safe instruments reflect the beams with the full power of the beam intact. False. Very good. Remember they have that specialized coating or finish on them that, you know, absorbs and, and uh, scatters that laser beam so it doesn't reflect the full power. Laser resistant endotracheal tubes are not necessary for intubation and procedures. No, either a laser safe VT tube or an alternative method of ventilation is necessary if you're sharing the airway. It is safe to leave the laser in ready mode when it's not being fired at the intended target. No, that's how accidents happen. And last question, the emergency off button will immediately shut down the laser during lasing. Very good. Any questions now? All right. Thank you guys, it was an absolute pleasure presenting to you all today. Um, if you guys, we do work with you guys uh, quite often. If you guys ever have any concerns about the service we're providing, I want to know, let us know. Um, if you guys have any questions about laser safety, utilize this as a resource. And again, thank you for your attention today.